All right, I want to start off today by asking you a question. I sometimes start off this way just to get you thinking. But when you see and hear this word, what immediately comes to mind? When you see and hear this word, hypocrite, what immediately comes to mind? Better yet, who immediately comes to mind? I understand some of you may not understand the meaning of this word, but basically it's, it's a word that describes someone who says one thing and does another thing. Uh, also today, especially as non-Christians think about, uh, look at the church and Christians, one of the reasons why they struggle so much, I think, with Christianity is not because of Jesus, and it's not because of Jesus' teachings. In fact, Jesus' teaching and Jesus are just as compelling today as they were 2,000 years ago. It's those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ and our hypocrisy that at times Christians, uh, or non-Christians, I'm sorry, have objections to. So what or who immediately comes to mind when you see and hear this word? It may be a politician, it may be a religious leader, it may be a family member, it may be a spouse or whoever that is. I mean, someone comes to mind. But you know the person who sometimes doesn't come to mind, who should immediately come to mind? It's the person in the mirror. You and me. We are the biggest hypocrites, aren't we? I mean, it's so easy to point fingers at everyone and everyone else, but if we are honest with ourselves for a moment, don't we struggle to live out what we know it's true? Don't we struggle at times to be honest? Don't we struggle at times to have integrity or not get angry and be loving and kind and be like Jesus to everyone? Don't we struggle with that? We know how we should live as a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not a Christian just yet, this doesn't apply to you. But if you are a Christian, then we know what we should be doing more often than not. But we struggle with doing that. And so that's why it's called hypocrisy. And so the solution to this, again, and to those, again, who are on the outside looking in at our lives, is found in this next phrase, truth be told. Truth be told. It's defined this way in dictionary.com. Truth be told is an expression used when someone reveals a fact or opinion they might otherwise hold back or lie about. Meaning, otherwise I wouldn't tell you, how are you doing? I'm fine. You're not fine, but you say you're fine, right? And we put on that facade oftentimes, especially in these kind of settings. I'm fine because we're scared of rejection. We're scared of being judged. We're scared of all these things. But truth be told is this expression that says, you know, I normally wouldn't be honest about this, but, you know, I am not fine. I am struggling this way. And that really is, I think, the solution to the biggest objection people may have to Christianity, that we're hypocrites. It's acknowledging that we don't have it all together. And yes, I do struggle with hypocrisy, just like you struggle with hypocrisy in certain areas of our lives. It's being honest about it rather than denying it. So let's do a little bit of exercise here, another exercise. Again, you don't have to if you don't want to, but fill in the blank in your mind. Fill in the blank for yourself, not for the person next to you, but for yourself. Truth be told, I am what? Let me give you some examples. This is for you. Truth be told, I am lost. Truth be told, I don't want to be here today. Truth be told, I am depressed. Truth be told, I am scared of dying from COVID. Truth be told, I am angry right now. Truth be told, I am depressed. Truth be told, I am overwhelmed. Truth be told, I am burnt out. Truth be told, I feel like giving up, giving up on my life. Truth be told, you fill in the blank. And the reason I share this is because when you and I are honest with ourselves, because the person sometimes that it's the hardest to be honest with is ourselves, the person in the mirror, that when we are so, then it begins this process of healing and growth. We're in a message series called Fail Forward. And in it, we've been talking about our mistakes and our failures. That these are things that God uses to grow us and that they don't have to define us or again, prevent us from moving forward. But in fact, these are things that God can use to help us grow to become the men and women God has called and created us to be. And so we're going to continue talking about today, about being honest about our failures. And again, the ways that again, it will be a blessing not only to us, but those around us. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn to Luke chapter 22, verse 31? Uh, feel free to, to look on the verses on the screen, on your paper Bibles, on your phones, whatever's most comfortable for you. And if you're new to church, coming back to church, feel free to do nothing at all. We honestly mean that. We're just glad you're here. We hope you have a great experience. You come back again, get to know us and this Jesus whom we love and whom we follow. Let me give you a little context for just a few verses we're going to park in today and talk about. This is at the very end of Jesus's earthly ministry. 
He's in the upper room with his core disciples. They're having the Last Supper. And the Last Supper must have been an amazing event. If I wish I was a fly on the wall, I wish I was there, just I could just watch everything that happened. It must have been epic. First of all, Jesus shocks his disciples because he puts on the garments of a servant, a slave. Remember what he does? He washes their feet. And again, that was shocking. And then Jesus again uh, gave the bread and the wine and he gave them the Lord's Supper. They didn't realize he was giving them an ordinance to do in remembrance of him until he came back, but he taught them that. Not only that, we know Judas used that time to leave to work out plans with the priests to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And then, as Jesus is talking about how he's going to die and suffer and he come back to life, the disciples are like arm wrestling, not literally, but they're arm wrestling metaphorically to see, again, who's going to be the greatest in Jesus' kingdom, right? They sort of bypass everything Jesus said, and they're talking about, like, they're expecting Jesus fully to establish this new earthly kingdom, world power, reminiscent of, of the kingdom of Israel under King David. And so they want to be in his cabinet, and they're figuring out who's going to be prime minister, who's going to be number one, number two, number three in that kingdom, And again, metaphorically, arm wrestling each other for this. And in the midst of that, Jesus speaks. He turns and he speaks to Peter. And I think today he speaks to us all as well through Peter in this. He says this in verse 31. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all, to sift all of you as wheat. Now he's talking to Simon Peter here, but why does he repeat his name twice? Does he stutter like I stutter? No, it's probably for emphasis, It's probably to get his attention. It might be also an expression of Jesus' emotion, emotional state, that his heart was breaking as he thought about what Simon Peter and the disciples had to go through, their moment of darkness, walking through the valley of the shadow of death moment when they thought Jesus had died and it was all over, and especially what Peter was going to go through. And he says to Simon, Peter, and to them all and to us today, Satan has asked to sift you all as we. Now, I realize for some of us watching online, for some of you here today, when you hear Satan or the devil, some of you feel like he's just a figment of our imagination. He's not real. He's just a convenient excuse that religious people use when they do wrong things, right? (laughs) Satan made me do it. It's not really my fault. But for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, we should know that both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the writers of Scripture took Satan seriously. More importantly, Jesus takes Satan seriously which should say to you and me that you you and I should also take him seriously. And here, notice that Satan has to ask for permission to do something. If you go back to Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2 in the Old Testament, you'll find out that when Satan wanted to test or torment Job, that he had to ask God for permission. For those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, Satan is real and he's powerful, but you know what? He again still has to ask God for permission to work in our lives or to torment us. And maybe that's why Peter wrote this later in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be alert and of sober mind. He's saying, don't freak out. <laughs> don't be scared. Don't be overwhelmed. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But as someone said, he has no more claws. He has no more teeth for those of us in Christ. He can still do some damage. He can still, again, mess with us. But he has to get permission from God Almighty to do the things that he may want to do in our lives. It just shows, again, where he is on the totem pole of power. He's way down there. And so Satan is asking to do what? And Jesus shares with Simon and all the disciples. He says to sift all of you as wheat. You here is plural. So he's referring to all the disciples. Now, we didn't grow up, most of us didn't grow up in an agricultural culture, state, region. Maybe some of you have. So when you hear this term sifting wheat, you're like, you might sort of have an idea what it is, but what does it actually look like? What is he talking about? Well, it's actually a metaphor for a severe trial, but GodQuestions.org says this. In biblical times, wheat or grain, other grain, was sifted through a sieve or large strainer. As it was shaken violently, the dirt and other impurities that clung to the grain during the threshing process would separate from the good, usable grain. Basically, you'd put it in a container, it sounds like, you'd just shake it like with all you had, and the point was to loosen the grain and the, the chaff that would cover it. And then there's a winnowing process as well, where you sort of chuck it up in the air when the wind's blowing, and the chaff would fly away and you'd be left with the heavier grain. And so this is a process they would do back then, and even today, now with modern technology. But it's a picture of really being shaken violently. 
So what Satan wanted to do with Peter and the other disciples was not a little poke. <laughs> not like, I'm messing with you, a little poke, you know, just tease you a little bit. He wanted to shake them so hard that their faith would crumble, that they would deny Christ, that they would walk away, just like he shook Judas, and Judas ultimately killed himself out of remorse for betraying Jesus. And so that's the kind of shaking that Satan wanted to do, violent shaking to them. But notice he has to ask permission from God to do that. Why would God allow that? Well, we're going to talk about that in a moment. But Jesus continues. He says this, But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. We're going to park in this verse for a while and just sort of break it down. First of all, notice what is Jesus doing for Peter and for the disciples and for us today? He is praying. He is praying for Peter. Now, why is this important? Because I think when you and I are going through difficult times, when you and I are feeling like failures, when we we are overwhelmed with shame and guilt and doubts, we feel like we're alone, don't we? We feel like no one knows what we're going through. And that may be true. But there's one person who knows what you're going through, one person who will never leave you nor forsake you, one person, even if no one else knows what you're going through and is not praying for you, one person who's always praying for you, whether you realize it or not. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus is praying for you. He's praying for you right now. He's praying for you right now. And he's praying for me right now. In fact, what Jesus says here is a foretaste of what's to come after his death and resurrection. Paul writes this in Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Meaning, what is Jesus doing right now? after his death and resurrection, after he ascended back into heaven, you know what he's doing 24-7? He's praying for us. He's praying for you and you and you, and he's praying for me. What is he praying? But before we get to that, one of the parts of, again, when you and I are struggling with failure and mistakes in our life, one way to fail forward is to remember that Jesus is always praying for you. You are never alone. He is with you. He says, surely till the end of the age, I am with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And I don't know about you, but that gives me tremendous comfort as I wrestle with my own personal demons and go through trials and other things. I realize Jesus is praying for me. The reason I'm standing here, the reason you're sitting here today, the reason we're still alive and in the faith is not because we're good people. It's not because we're religious. In part, it's because Jesus is praying for you and Jesus is praying for me. So what is he praying for Simon Peter and for us today? That your faith may not fail. That your faith may not fail, may not crumble, may not disappear, give way. Just like Judas, his faith gave way. Now notice what he's not praying for Peter. He's not praying that God would take away this test or trial or stop Satan from doing whatever he wants to do. To which you and I would be like, yeah, that just doesn't seem fair. I mean, haven't you been there? I don't want my faith strengthened. God, I want you to take away the cancer. I don't want my faith strengthened. I want you to heal my marriage. I don't want my faith strengthened. I want a job, right, that pays a living wage. I don't want my faith strengthened. And so for some of us, it feels like that just seems like a very odd thing for Jesus to do. It doesn't seem very loving. And if you feel that way, and I completely understand why you feel that way. But this is why I think Jesus did not take away the test or the trial for Peter. In fact, James, the brother of Jesus, says this. It's a long passage. I'm just going to cover it quickly. You might want to bookmark it and come back to it and study it more on your own. James says this, the brother of Jesus in James chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials, tests of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Notice here, there is a purpose to your pain. There is a purpose to the trials and testing we go through. It produces something. What does that produce? This thing called perseverance. Think of it as spiritual muscle. Think of it as developing core strength, right? When it comes to our workouts, you need a strong core to support the rest of your body. This is what testing does in our life. It produces this perseverance where you and I can hang in there for the long haul. This is not a sprint. It's a marathon. So it teaches us that. Not only that, what does this perseverance do? It says it continues its work. It finishes so that you and I can be mature, grown up spiritually, complete, not lacking anything, becoming the men and women God called us and created us to be. But where does it all start? Testing of our faith. 
it begins there. And that's why Jesus oftentimes doesn't take it away, but allows us to go through it. And that's why he allowed Peter to go through it as well. But Jesus not only is with you, praying for you, but he also prays for faith in the trials. Jesus is praying for faith, greater faith, greater strength to persevere through these trials. You may not realize it at the time, but this is how you can stay encouraged in the midst of your difficult times. You're not alone. He's praying for you. Not only that, but he's praying for your faith at this very moment as you're wrestling with that temptation, that discouragement, that shame, that guilt. He is praying that your faith is strengthened through this. And then not only that, he says he's also praying, and when you have turned back, You see, Jesus knows that he is going to fall. Jesus knows Peter is going to fail epically. It's one of the most epic failures in our New Testament, or especially in the gospel accounts, when Peter falls and fails. He knows this. And he says, when you turn back, that Jesus, again, is going to help him to get back up. You know, I think the greatest expression of our faith sometimes is not not failing, but when we fail, because we all fail, getting back up, following Jesus again, trusting him to redeem our failures, helping us. So not only is Jesus praying for you, not only does he pray for your faith in the trial, but Jesus helps us to get back up. And you know, when you look back on, if you've been walking with Jesus sometime, you've gone through ups and downs, you've gone through failures, you've gone through different poor choices, and you're here today. And if you're here today and you're sitting here or you're watching this online, whether you realize it or not, it's because Jesus helped you get back up. He says, I forgive you. I love you. You're not a waste. You're not junk. I still have a plan and purpose for your life. You're not defined by your failures. You're not defined by those poor choices, that person you dated, the things you spent your money on. No, I define you. He helps you get back up. And that's what he was also praying for Peter. He knew he'd fail. But he's saying, you know what? (laughs) When you get back up, not if you get back up, he says, you're going to get back up, Peter. Whether you realize it or not, I'm going to help you get there. And then he says, he's praying for them to strengthen your brothers. Strengthen your brothers and sisters. Now he's saying, again, as a result of everything you've gone through, as a result of, again, your failures and the the grace and love and forgiveness you've received, you're going to use that in turn and to strengthen your brothers. I think Paul is referring to that when he writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. He's talking about the God of Jesus Christ, the Father of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. You know, if you're going through a difficult time right now in your marriage, for example, then you should talk to another couple who's already gone through a difficult time. You should talk to people, maybe a couple who's gone through almost on the verge of divorce, got marriage counseling, got through it with God's grace and help, and then they now, again, are able to help you because, again, they've received God's comfort through that and now able to help you in the midst of your struggles. If you're a single person today and you're struggling with loneliness and even more so in our culture today, you talk to some other singles who've gone through this season, again, who are a little bit ahead of you. They've received comfort as well. You see, again, God doesn't waste our pain. And he's saying, again, at some point, whatever you go through, God is going to use to, again, help others. And that's why we said, okay, not only is Jesus praying for you, not only does Jesus pray for faith and trials and he helps us to get back up, he redeems and uses our failures. Jesus redeems and uses our failures. Your failures do not define you. In fact, they're part of the process. As long as you own up to it, as long as you again, again get to a place where you say, okay, Lord, I messed up. I need your help. That he can use it someday. I don't know when that is, but someday to help someone else who's going through a miscarriage someone else who's going through divorce, someone else, again, who had a loved one pass away from sickness, someone else who's going through something else, at some point, someday, he will use what you've gone through, your pain, it's not wasted. He'll use it to to strengthen someone else who's going through a difficult time. And that's what he's telling Peter. When you get back up, after you fail so epically, strengthen them. You know, the other thing I've noticed sometimes is that many of us, we can't empathize with people who are going through something we've never gone through. And sometimes you're like, ah, how, can, how can they struggle so much in their marriage? What's wrong with them? <laughs> or how can their kids be so you know, crazy? What is wrong with them? Or, or how can they be so broke? I mean, they both make six-figure salaries each. Ah, what's going on with them? Or how can they, that whatever it is. But when you go through it, when you go through a difficult time, you go through that situation, afterward you're like, ah, 
I used to point fingers at them, but I realize now, oh, I understand. Not only do I understand and empathize, but you know, I can encourage others who are going through the same thing, which is in part why God allows us to go through these things. And then how does Peter respond? We're going to move on here to what Jesus said. He says, but he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. You're like, wait a second, Peter. (laughs) Did you just hear what Jesus said? What is going on? I think, this is just my guess, that the disciples, just in their mind, there are things they understood about Jesus and what he taught, and there was a whole bunch of stuff they didn't understand. And so the stuff that they didn't immediately sort of understand or agree with, they just sort of pushed off into that bucket. And they're like, you know, uh, you know, we don't understand this, so blah, 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 we're just going to keep moving forward. I sort of think that's what they were like. The other thing, the Holy Spirit was blocking some things, I think, from them understanding until his, after his death and resurrection. But here he seems to sort of, again, sort of not or disagree with Jesus. Basically, this is his rebuttal. He's like, no way, Jesus. Not me. I don't know about these fools here. The rest of, I'm not pointing at you, but the other disciples. I I don't know about them. I I don't know what they're going to do, but Jesus, I'm your man. I got your back. I'm ready to die with you. I'm ready to go to prison with you, Jesus. You can count on me, Jesus. And when he said this, I think he meant it. I really think he meant it. I don't think he was making this up just to prop himself or his ego. I think he was just super confident. He was that type of dude. He was just really confident in himself. He had a lot of pride, probably, in himself, in his abilities, in his position in this group as the unofficial sort of leader and spokesman. And so he said this. But then we know what happened, some of us, with his story. And I think this is why Peter later writes this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, much later when he's older. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he will lift you up in due time. God gives grace, he reminds us a little earlier than this, God gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. See, Peter had experienced what it's like to be on that end where he was proud. And he had been on the end where he had been humbled by God. This is what we're going to talk about next. And he's learned from that, and he says, you know what, it's far better to humble yourself voluntarily And then God will lift you up. He'll give you grace than to be the one who, again, who's exalting yourself because then you will be humbled. And Peter goes through that. And you know, one of the things that I've learned and maybe Peter's learned here that that sometimes when we go through these, before we go through these difficult times, maybe you and I are the people who point fingers at people. I mean, again, I, I haven't met too many people who are intentional hypocrites. Like, you know, they know they're a hypocrite and they keep acting that way. Most of us, including myself, are unintentional hypocrites, right? And it comes out when we're angry or we're scared or we're upset and you point pink fingers at the government or certain groups of people or certain races or whatever different lifestyles and then God humbles you. And when God humbles you and you receive grace, you are more likely to give grace. Peter, before this happened, I'm sure he was a finger pointer. I just see that with Peter. <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, you guys see him pointing fingers everywhere. Oh, you guys aren't measuring up. You can't measure up. But after God humbled him, he... He was a grace giver. He was like someone, again, who had received so much grace from God that he also extended grace to everyone for the rest of his life and ministry. And so I think that's why he wrote this. And then Jesus says this to Peter, who says, I'm with you, Jesus, till the end. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me, you will deny three times that you know me. He's saying the Last Supper happened like Thursday evening. They had the Passover meal together. Jesus then left with them to go, remember, pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then you had Judas lead the priests into the garden and rest in probably the early hours of Friday morning. And then after that, he's taken into the priest's sort of courtyard, that able place to be tried by the religious leaders. And he's saying, before the sun rises the next day, so in a few short hours, you will deny knowing me three times. Let's fast forward here to the end of this chapter. And you can read on your own what happens, but let me summarize. So when Jesus is arrested, everyone deserts Jesus. They all flee, every man for himself, including Peter. And then Peter follows Jesus from afar. He goes to the courtyard of one of the priests, and then he's sort of watching what's happening from afar. And the servants, different people ask him, hey, weren't you weren't you with that guy, Jesus? Aren't you part of that group? And Peter denies knowing Jesus. I don't know him. And the third time, he denies it so vehemently, he's calling down curses. Like, God, kill me if I really know him. Like that kind of, he's just cursing. And then at that moment, it says, the Lord turned 
and looked straight at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. He says, you know, at that moment he saw Jesus' eyes. They made eye contact. And then in the, I think in the midst of being shell-shocked about Jesus' arrest, uh, scared what's going to happen next, he had forgotten about what Jesus had said. But in that moment, it all came back to him like with this crystal painful clarity. And then he remembered. And then the, this verse, the very last sentence, I think it's one of the most heartbreaking verses in all of the New Testament, in fact. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. He was a deeply broken man. He was deeply broken because he realized everything he had said had come to nothing. He had deserted Jesus in his moment of need. Now, the good news is this is not the end of the story. Peter's failures don't define him, but they help him to grow and to move forward to become the person he became. Preacher's commentary says this. When Peter came face to face with his own weaknesses and denial, he became Peter the Rock. We need not be ashamed of our weaknesses, our humanity. It can become a valuable asset. Jesus said Peter would be the rock. In fact, his name Cephas in Greek means the rock. But he didn't become the rock until after his failure, until after God helped him get back up. He would go on to be the leader or one of the main leaders in the early church. You can read his story in the book of Acts. He also went on to write 1 Peter and 2 Peter, letters to the church. Not only that, tradition and history tells us that he was martyred along with all the other disciples, the original core disciples, for their faith. And when he was killed, he asked to be killed, or he was going to be crucified, he asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel like he was worthy to be crucified and killed the same way his Lord and Savior was killed. So he asked to be crucified upside down, again, out of reverence and respect for Jesus. This man who denied Jesus so vehemently, right? Because, I mean, think about this for a moment. The other disciples, yes, they deserted Jesus, but they didn't deny him publicly three times that they knew him. This was his friend. This was his master, teacher, rabbi. And again, he just totally betrayed him in the worst way possible. But again, thankfully, that isn't the end of the story. God used that as a starting point to grow him into Peter the Rock, who would be again one of those cornerstones of the early church. Let me ask you that question again. To be honest, I am what at this very moment? Both here and those watching online. To be honest, I am what? You fill in the blank. My encouragement to you, if you want to fail forward, if you want to grow through this, and again, learn from Peter and the others in Scripture, be honest with your own failures. Be honest with your failures, with yourself. I think the hardest person sometimes And where we all need to start today, if you're not there already, is the person in the mirror yourself. To be honest with our struggles. Honest with, I don't know what I want. Be honest with, I don't even know if I believe still. Be honest with yourself. Because that's the beginning point of healing and growth. So again, this doesn't apply to everyone here, but maybe this is just where you need to start. Be honest with yourself. Chances are, by the way, people around you who know you well, they already know what you're struggling with. But you yourself oftentimes are the last person to know or at least admit it. To admit it's not always, you know this is a sign that it may be you. That when you're pointing fingers everywhere else, right? It's her, it's him, it's my boss, it's my spouse, it's my children, it's the government, it's whatever. When you're pointing fingers everywhere else, chances are the real problem is here. That you are the common denominator in all of these things. And so it's time before God and asking for help, just be honest with yourself. The second thing I would encourage you to do is find safe people to share with. Find safe people to share here with. Here at Pathway, if you're part of a small group, a CG, we call them community groups, that's, that's where it should be a safe place. Where what's said in the group stays in the group. Where maybe you're not comfortable sharing with the sisters in your group if you're a guy, but at least with some of the guys, they know what you're going through praying with you, holding you accountable, walking with you. And again, if you're a sister, doing the same. So that's being safe place. But if you don't have that safe place, uh, you know, you can always contact me and then I can talk you through a few things. But none of our pastors are professionally trained to do this. So we also will help you find a, a great Christian counselor. And Christian counseling is expensive. I know that. When my wife and I went to marriage counseling, it was expensive. 
But here at Pathway, we have a fund to help you pay for that counseling. There's no excuse. So if you need a safe place and people to talk to, and it's not your CG or you feel like your CG can't handle it or you're not in a CG, you can talk to me. We can help you get connected, even help pay for your counseling. The other thing I wanted to share here, for those of us who've gone through a lot, we've experienced what Peter's experienced. We've had epic failures in our Christian faith. We've received grace. He's helped us get back up. Maybe it's time for some of us to be that safe place for people to share with. Maybe God has allowed you, not maybe, to go through this season because there are other people in our church, maybe in your workplace, your neighborhood, who need someone with empathy and compassion and grace to point them in the right direction. Sometimes we make it so much about us, right? It's all about me, all about me, all about me, but it's not about you, especially if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. So my encouragement to you, if you know Jesus, and again, you're not struggling right now, and God has already brought you out of a season, praise God. Would you pray, God, open my eyes? Help me to see if there's anyone in my small group, in my church, in my community, that again, I can use what I've gone through to again, encourage them, to help them. Not because you're better than them, but because Jesus has given you grace and helped you through. Let me give you a couple of email addresses, just for reference. If you need, if you're not part of a CG or a small group here at Pathway, that's where discipleship happens, that's where life happens, you need to be part of one. If not at our church, then at some other church, wherever that is. But if you want to be part of a small group here at Pathway, email cg at pathwaybible.org. We'll get back to you right away. If you just want a, a cup of coffee or to talk over Zoom and just, again, sort of share what you're going through in a safe place with a safe person, me, I'd love to do that. And not only that, if you want to get a reference or just help getting a Christian counseling or just help getting some funds for marriage counseling or just for your personal counseling, just please let me know as well. You can email me, bobbly at pathwaybible.org. As I ask the praise to come back up, would you just be honest for a sec with yourself, with God, and just take it before him? Or maybe some of you who are doing great, thank Jesus that he's praying for you. The reason you're doing great is because he's been praying for you and he's been praying for your faith to be strengthened, help you get up and again, strengthen others. Wherever you're at today, would you just take some time and pray and be honest with yourself and be honest with God. Let's pray together. Amen. Thank you, Avian and Praise Team, for leading us into worship today. A few optional questions for reflection, discussion, devotion. Again, you don't have to do these at all, but again, just to, to reflect on the, the message. First of all, define the word hypocrite. And are Christians hypocrites because they fail? Second, why is it easy to put on a facade as a believer? And why is this a bad thing? Finally, how can we be more honest with ourselves and others about our struggles and failures? Please allow me to pray on our behalf before we go our separate ways. Let's pray. Jesus, to be honest, I'm tired. To be honest, Lord, I'm often overwhelmed. To be honest, Lord, I sometimes doubt. But the one thing, Lord, I don't doubt is your great love for me. I don't doubt the fact that I'm forgiven, that I'm redeemed, and that you are working all things out for my good and for your glory. Lord, I pray for everyone here today and I pray for those watching online that you would move us to a place where we trust you enough to be honest, Lord, with ourselves and with trusted people about our struggles, our fears, our shame, our guilt, our failures, Lord. And we don't share because we have to, but you encourage us to because that's the pathway to growth, Lord. That's the pathway to healing, restoration, Lord. And, Lord, ministry. Because in sharing, Lord God, that we allow others also the freedom to share their struggles, Lord God. And not only that, that the valleys and the difficulties you take us through, Lord, will be things that you will use one day. And I don't know when that is for all of us, but to be able to comfort others who are also going through the same thing. And we're not better than them. We've just a little bit ahead and experienced your grace and mercy and your goodness and your love through those difficult times. And so I pray for our church. I pray we be a church, Lord, where we are transparent with one another, where we honestly care for one another, where we pray for one another, where we help carry each other's burdens. 
Lord God, where we walk together through the valley of the shadow of death and sin. Lord God, where we, again, are honest about our struggles and our failures. And then we find grace, Lord, in the community that you've blessed us with, Lord. We thank you again for this day. Uh, thank you for the encouragement and the hope, Lord, and reminder again that we are loved, we are forgiven, we are redeemed, Lord, through Christ. And that, Jesus, you are always with us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for joining us today. I hope you have a great week. We'll see you next week.